Hello, everyone. My name is Lisa Allen. And I am one of the co-directors of the Notebooks Collective. We are a virtual literary art space focused on community, connection, and continued learning. We have future events listed on our website, including our next Write Together on July 16th, 2022, where we hold space to dedicate to writing for one hour. The Notebooks Collective believes that Black Lives Matter and acknowledges that as a virtual organization, our offices are on the unceded lands of the Kickapoo, Massachusetts, and Pawtucket tribes. Native peoples across the world continue to perse persevere and celebrate their cultures, and we encourage you to support Native writers and artists. Since our events are attended by people from all parts of the US, please check out this map of Native lands that Rebecca just put in the chat. Feel free to share what Native land you are zooming in from in the chat. We also want to note that we stand in solidarity with the people of Ukraine and against colonization and war in any form. This evening, we are here to celebrate the work of Marsha Karp and George Kalajaris. The event is structured as follows. Each poet will read a poem to begin, and then they will have a conversation, and then they will read more poetry, and there will be more conversation, and we will end with questions from the audience uh, that Marsha and George will be happy to answer. What happens during that whole middle part of the conversations and the reading is in the hands of Marsha and George. So if you have a question to ask, simply DM one of us, either me, Lisa, or Rebecca, and we'll flag it for our guests. And now I give the floor to Rebecca. Thanks, Lisa. Um, I'm so excited to be introducing our guests tonight. Um, when I think about what makes my creative life fulfilling, I realize that my relationships with other writers and creatives are vital, not to not just my work, but to my life. The two poets that we have with us tonight, Marsha Karp and George Kilajaris, have known each other for 25 years. They have been privy to each other's successes and to each other's struggles. They have similar backgrounds, but different writing styles. I imagine their relationship akin to a lifeline, a thread that can be followed back to the beginning, a thread that's been woven into everything between the, that beginning and now. I also realize when thinking about my own creative life that when I'm curious, I'm more engaged, more committed, and more excited. And I want to let you know in on a little secret. Um, sometimes when we plan these events, we know our, the presenters very well. Even then they surprise us by sharing work we've not yet read or telling us something about their creative process or the way they see the world that we've never talked about. So it's a supreme honor tonight to welcome Marsha and George. Not only are they an example of the type of poet friendship we aspire to, but their motivations, their histories, even their thoughts on craft and on the poetry landscape we find ourselves in today are curiosities to me. What an honor it is to open the screen to them and to listen and learn from their experiences and their stories. Marsha's Car Marsha Karp's book, If By Song, was published by Lily Poetry Review Books in 2021. She has published poems and translations in journals and anthologies in England and America, including the Times Literary Supplement, Harvard Review, The Guardian, Partisan Review, The Word Exchange, Anglo-Saxon Poems and Translation, and Joining Music with Reason, 34 Poets, British and American, Oxford, 2004 to 2009. She taught literary and editorial matters at Boston University after earning graduate degrees there. George Calajaris' most recent book of poems is Winthropus, Winthropus um, from Louisiana State University Press. He's also the author of Guide to Greece, a book of paired poems and translation, Dialogos, and poems based on the notebooks of Albert Camus, Camus Carnets. His poems and translations have been anthologized in Joining Music with Reason, chosen by Christopher Ricks. He teaches English literature and classics and translation at Suffolk University. And so without me talking anymore, I'd like to welcome Marsha and George. Yeah, I think the way Marsha and I have talked about it is that I would start and read three poems. Um, I love the word lifeline that you used, uh, Rebecca, and certainly Marsha has been a lifeline to me in terms of my life and my lines. Uh, so it's a wonderful choice. I'm starting off with a poem called The Evening Star. I boarded the blue line at Aquarium Station. The only empty seat 
was the one by that young, head back, eyes closed, exhausted looking father, holding his sleeping child in his folded arms. It was already supper time, and the evening star, as Sappho sings, was calling all of the creatures home to their mother through the rush hour traffic. Subway was coming out of the tunnel's mouth, and I was 60 when I suddenly felt a tiny hand start pulling at my sleeve. In his sleep, the child I never had was reaching out for me, while the father I never became kept his eyes shut. And all the way to my stop at Orion Heights, nothing disturbed our dream. The next one is called Baby Monitor. I have a number of poems in my book about um, my mother's um, experience of Alzheimer's. Baby Monitor. She's sound asleep, or her Alzheimer's is. I can hear each breath she takes through the monitor I keep on my desk, hooked up as it is to the one upstairs beside her bed. The kind of listening device that's used for keeping track of infants. The tremulous speaker could fit in the palm of your hand. The little green light pulses every time it picks up any trace of my mother's voice. Babble of baby talk and muffled whimpers. Those garbled bits expelled from her speech machine. It's plastic speaker propped all night on its stand, calling out softly some rhythmical ruminant something so automatic it might be dreaming out loud in my mother's oblivious voice. Oh, Sibylline machine that makes the incomprehensible clear. And please help her and please guide him and stop it from spreading to the kidneys, please, dear Lord, and make that enough to meet their mortgage payments. I'm privy to a prayer that no one else can hear, at least tonight, some primal psalm where all are nameless, but none of them forgotten. And please, and please, and please, goes the little green pulsing light. Um, I think, it, Rebecca, if you could put um, the Hades poem up on the share screen. Okay, great. And as I read, I guess you can scroll down. Uh, my father had a little grocery store, he was a Greek immigrant, and many of the poems in Winthropos, which was his name, the Greekified name he gave to Winthrop. Uh, uh, many of the, the poems are, are come out of that grocery store, uh, Greek immigrant world, Hades. And I, I'm, I'm gonna say a few things about, mainly about the end of this poem uh, as part of the conversation. Hades. I was trying to hit with a rock, a paper kite. My taunting cousin was flying above our yard, but struck instead a black DeSoto's windshield. And now my mother stands by the stove, arms akimbo, but face beseeching him to go easy. Just home from work, but still in his butcher's apron, my father kneels before me. Look me here, I lift my head, beholden to what his index finger won't let me avoid. Those disappointed eyes 
of my immigrant father, who never struck me, but whose old world admonitions always left me badly shaken, as if I'd betrayed his grave injunction, you, my right hand. But this time he winks and says instead, do you like mama to make for you a baby sister, Yorgo? I think I nodded my head, then ran outside, but not before I heard my mother's shriek of sheer elation's laughter, sunlit and soaring. Sometimes in dreams, my father grips my shoulder. Look me here, he says, his glasses obscured by greasy smoke from the meats, by the filth of leafy. And you, my right hand, so many errand throws, but only one that cracks with a rock, a black DeSoto's windshield, and lets me hear their laughter. My parents, down there, where nothing breaks the silence. Um, I just want to say a few things just about those last um, six lines. Um, Lethe, of course, is the, the river of oblivion, the river of the underworld. Um, just to give you an idea, I don't want to sort of make it imply that there's some sort of takeaway home, pay, takeaway pay that you can bring home from a poem. Um, it's always whatever the poem is doing while you're reading the poem. But just to give you an idea of what I'm doing, I am mainly write in meter in five beat lines. And if you look at the very last line, um, my parents down there where nothing breaks the silence. And, and it's, you know, for me, it's, um, it's not, you know, it's not a kind of metronome, da, 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 da. It's, it's, it's being, you know, trying to be, become spellbound by a language, by the meter, by the music and allowing that meter to sort of allow you to discover things in the lines. And in this one line, last line, what I was happy about is parents was on one side and silence was on the other side of the line. And it's a kind of rhyme. And in between, in the next to the last foot is breaks. So nothing breaks to silence except remembering the broken window windshield that caused my parents to laugh. And the other thing I just wanted to call attention to is that along with the kind of formal meter, this is a very demotic vernacular element. And that is my father's speech. I don't use it much. I waited a long time to get these phrases in. But when he says, look me here the second time, you know, the here he's in Hades. Um, and then if you can scroll back down, uh, when he says, and, and then what, when he says, you, my right hand, when it comes back and you, my right hand, it allows me to address my own writing hand. So just those two, I just wanted to point out those two aspects of the, the meter, the formality and the, um, you know, the sort of living speech. And I'll hand it off to Marsha. Thank you. I, I'm going to start with uh, just two short poems by really my my first and deepest uh, teacher. And it's not only just because this is an opportunity to do that, but also because I think it's important um, to know that influences and learning and all doesn't come up with a predictable result. That, that the writings of uh, Ted Richer, who was really a teacher of mine for a very long time, are very different from mine, but it doesn't lessen anything that I learned from him. Wonder, one, our mother often insisted to anyone who would listen that her grandfather, 
was one wonder rabbi who could always reveal the mystery of life. Two, my mother always insisted to anyone who could listen, like me, that her grandfather was one wonder rabbi who would often reveal the miseries of love. Three, mother once gave to me an old photo, like me. You should know, mother insisted. And this also is by uh, Ted Richard. And I'm going to read it the way he did. So you can blame him for the way I read it. <laughs> Lullaby. Time went by, time went by and by. Time went bye-bye. Life went by, life went by and by. Life went bye-bye. Love went by, love went by and by. Love went bye-bye. You went by, you went by and by. You went bye-bye, bye-bye. I went by, I went by and by, I went. So one of the things that I learned uh, continually from him is I know that people sometimes react with a, like they've been electrocuted when the admonition or, or just the idea that you write what you know is brought up. But for me, this is almost a, a, a law. First of all, it's impossible to do anything you don't know. But, but I think what's missing often in understanding that is something that Ted helped by adding on to it, that a writer writes what she knows in the way that she knows it. And, and to me, that opens up the world. It doesn't limit anything, but what it does is ask for an honesty. And um, I like to think I always have that. I know I probably uh, fall short, but, but this particular poem that I'm reading next uh, seems to me addresses that directly. And then I'll read one more after that. Evening dance class. You forget you have told me this three weeks running and I can see you slower than the others, afraid of putting the wrong foot forward and back to the side, tap the toe twice, then the heel. I see you stretching too long to the left, palms down when they should be up, the line of the newly enrolled moving here and you still there. I see the swell of your ankle and tears and you counting and keeping together with the intruders as best you can. Ignored now, neither stopping nor dancing. I can even see you writing your letter, telling your teacher how hurt you are to be now left behind. But I can't because you close the door and play the music for yourself alone. See you just later in spin, in time, alone, in tune, held up light and live by your wrists and graceful sweep, afraid in your dance of no one and nothing. And like, I, I'm sure like everybody else, we meet our teachers by accident. And this is um, home for someone that I, I met on by accident during life. The poet David Ferry, April 4, 27, 2007, Boston. He had both a level broadness across his shoulders and a tallness so that when he changed his posture in order to lower his gaze, creating the illusion that he was on our level, though he was instead still over our heads now by some fewer inches, he did so 
by a torque that raised his right shoulder and lowered his left. It seemed so natural a posture to him, habitual, as if he'd lived long in his full height among people much shorter, among whom his disciplined inclination brought everyone comfort. Being so broad, some part of him was still tall in his torque, though his head was lowered by that kindness of his, that was one kind of talking down to us, but not another. A listener needn't have known of the poet's recent catastrophe, nor have cared a fig for the life of the poet in order to have trusted what he wrote in his own ways about the mundane and in the old ways of lives that no one has or could really live, unless it is that the ferryman of metaphor can and alone from the jealous belly of time return and return us our mutilations now staunched for the moment to any life whatsoever. So when the poet brought over for us that old story of how Hades whetted his own seasonal grief on the moment of another's, because this time art came hard and perfected on the heels of sorrow, we too fell for a moment for the ruse. But that infallible assayer was only setting his gold to spin for the dizzying pleasure of pain. He had to have known, he knew. The terms were all his, that no husband who loved could but twist back and down toward the wife he held on to tight, could but for a second of comfort become the last death she'd suffer. So then when the gold on Mr. Ferry's finger came forward as he accommodated to us by his diagonal bow, even those who had had no clue must have realized that the ring told the life in the song that was just then not an old one at all, for it looked for all the world like the mouth of Orpheus still in its no, or like the bewildered path worn smooth by a dog in its faithful circle on the trail for the scent of its mistress. And now George and I are going to to talk, right, George? Yes. Um, did you want to? Um, did you want you wanted to go? Did you want to go one more round or go to before we go to the basal and the? Uh... Yeah, we have one more round after that. Okay. But, but did we want to just say something back and forth now? Sure. Um, one thing I'll say is that just to repeat two lines. Um, from the David Ferry poem, and David is a dear friend of both of ours and a, a great poet and a great translator. He's 98 years old. I sent him the link, but I don't think he can see it on the screen to get in, but if he's there, uh, hello, David. Uh, but Marsha had these lines, though his head was lowered by that kindness of his, that was one kind of talking down to us, but not another. Such a beautiful use of kindness and kind. Uh, and even there's a kind of rhyme there, kindness, kind of talking down to us, kindness. And I see that all the time in Marsha's work, that kind of lyric precision um, where effects are not, uh, effects are within the, 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 the dramatic um, needs of the line. Um, they're not overlaid. Uh, they're coming up out of the out of the poems. You know, jo thank you, George. You know, George and I um, met at uh, Boston University. I, I, I knew Ted for undergraduate, my aborted undergraduate education. But um, so we had some of the same teachers and you, you just said something that, um, that I just reread looking through uh, some writings of Jeffrey Hill and he talked, George, in some way you gave me a good example because I was struggling for one about technique being being ethical. I mean, working that 
that part of being ethical is how your technique is used. And it's interesting because for Ted, the ethics came in um, a certain kind of um, honesty. So um, I wanted to say, I don't know, you know, I know it's hard for everybody just hearing these things or even if you've read them before, just hearing them. But the evening star, um, you know, he, he, named, he named Sappho, right? And he names her evening star. And um, th th this, there's really a, a family tree in, the, in, this, uh, in this short poem about not having progeny. But um, so from Sappho, then we get Robert Louis Stevens who took the Sappho poem about um, Hesperus, the evening star. Uh, should I just read Requiem? Sure. Uh, this is Robert Louis Stevenson. Under the wide and starry sky, dig the grave. Oh, so, so Sappho just talks about the evening star as the herdsman and he gets everybody home. That George sort of gave us that. In Stevenson's Requiem, under the wide and starry sky, Dig the grave and let me die. Glad did I live and gladly die. And I laid me down with a will. This be the verse you grave for me. Here he lies where he longed to be. Home is the sailor, home from the sea. And the hunter, home from the hill. So it seems to me in George's, when, when every time I read this, as Sappho sings was calling all of the creatures home to their mother, just as um, piercing George. So, so that's the Robert Louis Stevenson. And then you might've heard something that was familiar. This be the verse you grave for me. This is what you wrote on my tombstone. So then we have the, we have the Larkin poem, this be the verse. So this family gets extended and sort of the, I don't wanna make a watertight case, That's, um, so it's hard not to seem like I'm trying to prove something, but just to, to lay out some of the things that go into a poem like The Evening Star. Um, Larkin's poem, that's not related to Sappho's poem and related to George's poem, is really, is it a joke? Is it bitterness? It's hard to say about a poem that starts, they fuck you up, your mom and dad and ends with don't have any kids yourself. But um, it's, it seems to bring into starkness George's poem for me. So I like very much whether he, well, we'll talk about probably intention as we go, but for me, that's not the issue. Um, intention is just what's there. It seems like all of the other poems are, are here in some way, George, in this. Thank, thank you, Marsha. I just wanted to say that the, the Sappho, the literal translation would be Hesperus, the evening star, which is also Venus. Uh, bring back all the things of light scattering day. You bring the sheep, you bring the goat, you bring the child to its mother. That's a very beautiful two lines. Um, I just want to say one other thing about Marcia's David Ferry poem. Um, you might have heard at the end the way that it moves. Um, you know, there, there's a way that metaphor um, Metaphor can be an intensification of, of that, I think, ethical quality that Mark Marsh is talking about and an intensification of feeling. But in, in her poem, it becomes the ring on the finger. It becomes um, the tolling, tolling bell of the song. It becomes the open mouth of Orpheus. Now, David is the translator of Virgil. And it's in Virgil's Georgics that Orpheus goes down into the underworld to recover his wife. It becomes the open mouth of Orpheus and it becomes a dog on its bewildered path, uh, worn smooth by a dog to its faithful circle on the trail for the scent of its mistress. And the word bewildered um, becomes uh, one of David's books, Bewilderment. David has a poem about a dog sort of making a trail in the um, snow so that the poem um, is looking, the poet is looking for his wife through his own poems, tracing back uh, the, the partner that for him, Anne Ferry, was uh, a great uh, literary critic 
but the, the, his best reader was reading his lines. And Marsh's metaphor, I think, takes us back to that intimacy through the literature, which would have made, meant everything to David, which does mean everything to David. So thank you, Marsha. Shall we go to the next? Yes, please. Okay. Um, okay, I think I'm gonna read two here. I don't know if, if that may be enough time, but let's just see how much time it takes and, and let us know how we're doing for time. But um, uh, Lisa mentioned uh, Ukraine and we're, uh, uh, certainly there's war going on. So I wanna read two war poems. Uh, the first one is called Rain, and it's um, it's an homage to the to the nineteenth to the twentieth uh, century British World War One poet Edward Thomas, who died at the very end of uh, World War One. Uh, Rain, and he has a poem called Rain. Rain. It was pain, midnight pain. Nothing but the wild pain he heard, as if his prayer could channel the rain, falling to tell him that someone was dying alone, lying out there with others, drenched to the bone, helpless as broken reeds in the cold, cold water. Answer me if you can. Does the rain have a father? Said the whirlwind to Job as he lay in the terminal ward or out in the trenches. It's what the poet heard, lashing the roof of his hut as the sound of sheer dissolution kept his body awake to the pure isolation of all those in pain, midnight pain, and nothing but wild, flawless lines to the wild, falling rain that calls itself catharsis, a tender Edward Thomas. Um, if you can put up the horses of Achilles, uh, Rebecca. Okay, this is the horses of Achilles. It's a poem that's by the modern Greek poet Kavafi. It's um, his own interpretation of some lines in book 17 of the Iliad. Um, and let me read it first, and then I want to talk about it. Um, spend a little bit of time talking about it as, as part of the discussion today, uh, because we had mentioned that translation might be one of the topics. Uh, the Horses of Achilles. When the Horses of Achilles turned and saw Patrick was dead, that beautiful young man, so brave and strong, they both began to weep. Suddenly that Olympian breed felt bewildered by death's outrageous display of what it is. No matter how they arch their necks and toss their wild, luxuriant manes, or stamp their hooves as if to wake him up, they couldn't shake off what they were seeing, seeing it there in the dirt. That heap of flesh and bones with the pitiful look of Patroclus. Their rider's breath was gone. Now he was nothing, nothing now and nowhere. But now it was Zeus who was moved and seeing all that was happening to that immortal pair, he wondered why he'd been so foolish once. Surely it would have been better, my dear sad horses, if I had never offered you as a gift at the wedding feast of Peleus and Thetis. What on earth were the two of you doing down there yoked to the cars of such pathetic creatures. Mortals are nothing but the dust at your heels. Old age and death can never catch up with a steed that flies like the wind. And yet you carry on as if men had bridled you to their misery. But those two gallant horses kept right on weeping, weeping for Patroclus still shedding their tears as if there was no end to what they felt. Um, if you can go back to the top, Rebecca, back to the beginning. Uh, as you could make out from the poem, these are immortal horses. 
And um, there's very little magic in the Iliad, but in this case, um, there was in, in the sense that these were horses that could talk, but they were stunned into grief in seeing um, their rider dead, Patroclus, because normally Achilles would be their rider and Achilles of course had never died. Um, Right from the start when translating this poem, it reminded me why um, translation is always an exercise in failure. I mean, that doesn't mean you don't have opportunities to do things um, with difficulties, even though the, the exigencies of English are different than those of Greek. But the word for horse in the ancient is ipos. In modern Greek, it's alogo. Kavafi used modern Greek, alogo. And if you look at that word alogo, you can see it's A-L-O-G-O. -O. It's a logos. It means what's irrational, but literally it means what doesn't have speech. So from the title, he's already telling you using the modern Greek that this is a modern Greek poem and that these are creatures who are stunned into um, speechlessness. Uh, one of the things about the, the Greek, the Homeric Greek world, and it's, it's in that poem about my father and Hades, is that it's, a, it's, a, it's an anti-Mediterranean world. It's, it doesn't have, there's no, speech, there's no speech, there's no water, there's no light. Um, you don't, you're not reborn again. There's only a very few people who went to the Isle of the Blessed, and we don't know why they got there, but you're, you're doomed to be a phantom. Um, but I want to look at, the, just talk about two things. I want to talk about the line, now he was nothing, nothing now and nowhere. And um, that last line of the first stanza, and I want to just read a very short paragraph about it. The no in now, becomes the no in nothing or no thing. And then the no in now and the no in nothing become the no in nowhere or now where. As if the words were enacting the horse's discovery of the awful truth, the non-negotiable, absolute negation of life. As the sensitive horses ponder the insensate body of the beautiful hero lying in the dirt. I wanted those implacably dismayed spasmodic repetitions of no to suggest the pounding hooves Kavafi so wrenching, wrenchingly mentions earlier, a detail not in Homer. And it always struck me that the horses are stomping on the ground like kids trying to wake up a parent. Um, so that's one thing I wanted to try. That's not in the Greek, that nothing now and nowhere, but the, 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 the idea is in the Greek. And maybe this gets at something, I think, of what the ethics of what Marshall was talking about, about language, that to be true to the Greek, I had to alter it a little to bring over the, um, the, the, the high premium on life that the Iliad puts. If we can go to the very end, um, the very end of the poem, um, but those two gallant horses kept right on weeping, weeping for Patroclus, still shedding their tears as if there was no end to what they felt. Um, in my version, I wanted the ending line to be entirely monosyllabic, as if there was no end to what they felt, to give the salience of the tears a simple, irreducible finality. But I couldn't get anything like the sweeping, huge, huge hearted heartbreak of Kavafis to Thanatu, Tin Panto Pimeni, Tin Symphoron, the everlasting calamity of death. The Greek means the everlasting calamity of death, uh, which is Daniel Mendelssohn's translation, which means that my concluding lines don't allow for the dense pitch of the horse's rich perplexity the poem's intractable pathos, which like the Iliad becomes the undying replenisher of generous tears, eternal eyes elaborating a world of woe. 
the great Alexander Pope translated this passage in um, his great translation of, of, of the Iliad, um, the one that Samuel Johnson said was the greatest work in English literature. And Pope, Pope ended the lines, the big round drops course down with silent pace, conglobing on the dust. You can't be conglobing on the dust. The whole world is in that, a world of woe. So I'll end there and I'll pass it back to Marsha. I, I just didn't want to cut into your time, Marsha. Oh, well, no, no, we'll be fine. Birds and cemeteries. It must be the shade that draws them or else the grass. And it seems they always alight away from the, their flocks alone. It's so quiet here, you can't help but hear their talons clink as they hop from headstone to headstone. Their sharp inquisitive beaks cast quizzical glances. The lawn is mown, the gate is always open. The names engraved on the stones and the uplifting words below the names are lapidary as ever but almost never even a chirp from the birds, let alone a wild shriek as they perch on a tomb. And then they fly away, looking as if they couldn't remember why it was they came, but we're doing what our souls are supposed to do on the day we die, if the birds could read the words. It's all beautiful, but I'm not going to talk about it till after I read. Okay. Um, so one of the, the things that, again, I think I was very fortunate to, to learn, to consider what it was, was abstractness and concreteness or general, the general and the specific. And often what I find happens is that I have something specific in mind. And then if I can abstract it and then rewrite the specific, that, 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 that's for me something that um, often in the next poem, I'm writing about something I really don't have the words for. And I think maybe that came, if not to my rescue, to, to come and comfort me along the way of not getting where I wanted. Um, this is called What is Left. We think it is new. We are so, so afraid. We think there has never been, ever been a thing like our thing, so we are so afraid. Just think, a village rapes a girl, a village burns a man. Here is the maelstrom, here is the horror. People we like are like people we don't. It is our turn to live it and not know what hit us. It is our turn for mayhem that droppeth as rain. It is our turn to cry, we are virtue's last bastion, while mayhem and help us turn us into them. She is 12 and they rape that girl over and over. That collar of tire, which then becomes fire, is fitted by many hands to one neck. Nobody taught us. We know how to do it. We shout and we leap for our lives to some standing. It is you, no, not I, yes. And no, 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 help us. We say that that thing is loosed from another town over. Oh, tut, tut, just think. It is ours and is us. What is left for our thing when havocs and swing, all against all, first among none. And, and now I'm gonna make a, a really radical break in, in tone, but um, it makes sense to me. So, so this, is, this is a riddle. And um, if you can solve the riddle, that would be great. It's from the Exeter uh, book, which is from the 11 centuries ago, the late 10th, 10th century, it's thought to be. And one of the things about translating for me 
And also, of course, in my own work, but my own work, this is easier than in translation, which is the tone of something. And, and these poems in the Exeter book have no tone, zero. They're just flat. So I got a chance to translate three of these for, um, for a project. And each one I did in a different way. So this is riddle number 86. Many men were sitting wise and deep in thought. A thing came into where they sat. Here are the things this thing has got. One eye for its seeing, two ears for its sounds, two feet to walk round on, around on its rounds. Twelve wise men each counted up ten heads times ten. The heads are enough heads for twelve hundred men. Two hands for its doings, two arms as is custom, attached to two shoulders from which it can thrust them. One back and one front to hold it together, one neck and two sides that keep out the weather. Tell me truly, tell me do, the name I shall be called by you. So we'll leave the answer for later. And here's a translation that really I owe so much uh, to this translation and to the person who assigned me the translation, Rosanna Warren. George took her class before me. Um, the translation seminar that really became famous partly because she had people come in and all sorts of people to talk to her students, but just because of who Rosanna is. And we were given, um, tell us 101, turns out it is, number 101 Canto to Translate. And um, she helped me get this published. And, um, but, but here, Tone, that was my first work. I don't know, I knew less Latin then than I know now, but still we had a trot. But I spent days walking around imbuing the tone of it. Uh, it's called Brother. Driven through people and people and places, I am come to this terrible service, brother, so I might give you your last gift, the death gift, might talk to your ashes, might listen in vain for their voice. Since your life took you from me, seized you, unjust, brother, misery took you from me. Now, as we were taught by our parents here, I offer my last gift, a death gift. Take it, wrapped only in brotherly tears. And always, my brother, now I have found you. Farewell. And just one more poem, Us Out. I've all but given up, you know, shut it down all but completely. I didn't shut the running motor. It's not right that you weren't there. I'm the girl and I'm the youngest. Where were you to tear the bag that really killed him? Not the car. Shut my mouth and shut my wanting. Shut behind polite and mustn't. I could have shut her off and didn't. I kept her as a tended nightmare. She kept coins because you had. Someone paid for, wiped her off. Shut out love because I loved you. Shut off growth because, who knows? He must have been something to win her then when she was a glorious girl and he wasn't yet our sad raging father. Where were you when I lost his body? to science or garbage. I don't know where it went. Where were, when you shut the door, you, when you shut us out? Um, before we go on, I just wanna say a few things about two poems that Marsha read. And um, her great poem, What is Left, which I think speaks to the maelstrom of our times. Uh, it came out in Eileen Cleary's uh, beautiful Lily Press edition. And I wrote the, uh, one of the blurbs and my 
blurb reads, uh, listen to these harrowing lines, the levelness of whose cadences and the accuracy of whose statements are as intensely concerned with registering the world's indifference as they are in resisting sentiment, is the lines. She is 12 and they rape that girl over and over. That collar of tire, which then becomes fire, is fitted by many hands to one neck. Nobody taught us, we know how to do it. It's a four great lines. And I, I think, you know, I, Marsha could talk, speak to this if she'd like, but, you know, I, in staying close to feeling, but having also a grasp of the tradition as Marsha does, um, um, she's kind of all ears to what accrues to her own language. And whether this was meant to be or not, I heard two allusions to great poems uh, and Marsha's poem uh, in, in their, you know, seriousness of their lines uh, drew those, those drew my ear to these lines. One is from Auden's great poem, The Shield of Achilles. So if you move from those lines, she is 12 and they raped that girl over and over. Here's Auden's, some lines from Auden, Auden's poem. That girls are raped, that two boys knife a third were axioms to him who'd never heard of any world where promises were kept or one could weep because another wept. Um, later in Marsha's poem, there are these three lines. We say that thing is loosed, is loosed from another town over. And is loosed is along with one other line, just think of uh, the shortest line in the poem. I cannot hear the word loosed um, in a poem of this kind of intensity, uh, speaking about uh, the havoc being in swing, the maelstrom, without hearing Yeats's poem, uh, Yeats's second coming, which uses the word loosed. The blood dim tide is loosed and everywhere the ceremony of innocence is drowned. Certainly that's true of Marsha's poem. So I just wanted to point out those powerful allusions. Oh, thank you, George. That that's always nice. That, thank you. And and I wanted to go back first to your um to your rain. I I know it's hard for people just hearing it, but I'm going to read the, the the end of it. It's sort of and nothing but wild, flawless lines to the wild falling rain that calls itself catharsis. Oh, tender Edward Thomas. And I always hear a rhyme there of catharsis and Thomas. And uh, it's just to me, uh, one of the great rhymes ever. But also, I hope everybody then looks up Thomas's poem rain. Um, and actually all of Thomas, but um, Edward Thomas. But um, hold on, I wanted to say more. Oh yeah, the, the Horses of Achilles is just, it's one of the most painful to, to, to have the, um, to have these animals crying. I didn't know that they lost their, their voices, their words. You know, isn't that what the word infant is? It means without language. And so when you said that they were pawing the ground, almost like, you know, children trying to yeah. really something. And, um, and, and, you know, in talking uh, to a friend about this book, he saw this, George's book, um, Winthropos, he saw this as the growth of a poet. That's sort of a, you know, a, a phrase. Th that, that that's what the nature of this book is. And it's true that from start to finish in the Birds and Cemeteries is the final poem. This is a poem about language and about language in the life of the poet from the beginning through till now. But I don't see this as a book. I wouldn't ever call, say that's what this book was. To me, this is a book of compassion. It's a book about suffering 
other people's suffering and understanding it and not, uh, not getting any benefit from other people's suffering in any way. But, but, but to me, every, almost every poem, there might be one or two that don't fall under this, but almost in every poem, the, the, there's a s human suffering that George takes on in, in a very special way. I think maybe I'll have a chance to talk more about that in the next, uh, the next section. So what we decided to do was, we each sort of had a poem of the others we wanted to talk about. Um, and so George is gonna read, we're gonna talk for a while about George's poem um, first. Okay, um, I'm gonna read this poem, Basil, and it's, uh, it's uh, in my book, Guide to Greece, and it's the first poem in the book. And it's based on, a. a my father was from a little Greek village and he kept, my mother's people were too, they were from mountain villages. And he kept this tradition of blessing the house with a basil leaf, which was really a way of protecting it against um, intrusion. Um, and, and, and of course they, you know, they couldn't keep out the sicknesses that invaded. Uh, so this is called basil. Sometimes on Sundays, while we were still asleep, my father blessed the house with a basil leaf and a little glass half filled with holy water. The sprig was from our next door neighbor's garden and the holy water seemed no different to us than faucet water, although it came from church. In clear plastic tubes that looked like medicine bottles, when they were filled with light on the kitchen sill. Most times I'd wake up just in time to see him pass down the hall, dipping the sprig in a glass as he sprinkled every doorway in the house, repeating something in Greek I couldn't follow, some phrase he muttered quickly under his breath, each time the sprig would break the water's surface. And then I was seeing through a glass so clearly, even the veins of the leaf stood out from a distance. Before I knew it, the whole house smelled of basil. You could count your blessings in the sunlit dew cast off so lightly, but never nonchalantly by the leaf in his right hand, as if you were struck by the morning glimmer left on everything the water happened to touch, drawing a bead on the dilating bead that brightened the bureau's brass handle and kept you focused on the here and now. Until a later date, when the priest would perform the very same ritual all over again, but this time stopping at the threshold of the altar where the sleeper refused to wake. Do we call the glass half empty or is it half full? The answering voice breaks off between the verses. Basilico. My tongue curls back on its stem like a wet leaf, companion to low chanting. So I just want to make a, a a comment that's not the most serious, but um, those of you who, who remember the beginning of Lolita, I think it's the second sentence. Lolita, the tip of the tongue taking a trip of three steps down the palate to tap at three on the teeth. Christopher Ricks can really do that one well. And, and, um, and I remember people saying, oh, he got it wrong, but I do it and I get, my tongue does what um, Lolita's, uh, what um, Humbert Humbert says, his does. And so when I read George's, I did the same thing at the end. My tongue curls back on its stem like a wet leaf, saying basilico. And it's really true, it does that. It's really um, something to, to use what's really there. And again, I, I sort of had a, 
had the challenge put before me that, that the, the technique is where you can make things up. But, but, but use the world because that gets you the richest thing. You know, I was very disappointed to find out, and he's not listening, so I'll say this, that um, Philip Levine's brother was not an opera singer. And there's a great poem, What Work Is, um, where, he's, where his brother is standing in line for a job at a Detroit car plant, but his brother is an opera singer. But his brother wasn't an opera singer. To, to, to me, that, that takes away from the poem, but that's, that's my own thing. Um, so what struck me about this poem when I first read it, when, when Guide to Greece came out, um, was it, it, it sort of struck me how unmean George is in his poems. Not that there's anything wrong with being mean and bitter and vicious and all that, in poems, but that's just not George's voice. That's not, and what really clenched it for me, you mind, can I read it now, George? What was, was this other poem that this, this reminds me of, and then I wanna talk about, uh, about that. This is, many of you will know this, Those Winter Sundays by Robert Hayden. Sundays too, my father got up early and put on his clothes in the blue-black cold. Then with cracked hands that ached from labor in the weekday weather made banked fires blaze. No one ever thanked him. I'd wake and hear the cold splintering, breaking. When the rooms were warm, he'd call and slowly I would rise and dress, fearing the chronic angers of that house speaking indifferently to him who had driven out the cold and polished my good shoes as well. What did I know? What did I know of love's austere and lonely offices? So like George, when he mentioned uh, the Auden and the Yates, which I'm very grateful for, for having come through in my uh, poem unbeknownst to me, you know, finding illusions is one of those things that I think we both were tutored in, but also to be careful. And Christopher Ricks has this wonderful phrase called cumulative plausibility. Okay, so, so one of the things, and again, for me, what's important is not whether George used the Hayden or not, whether it's an allusion to it or not, but, it, but, but, but the difference in voice that, that, that the real, well, I like to, shouldn't say it, but that, that a real poet will allow themselves, you know, for good, bad, or indifference to, to, be, to be part of how they see the world in their poems too, and not pretend to be a different kind of person. So when George starts sometimes on Sundays and Hayden starts Sundays too, my father got up early. I'm gonna stop myself. I'm not trying to prove that, that that Hayden's poem is here um, because it's reasonable to think at least the way the world was at various times that Sunday mornings fathers might do something different than they do on the other days. And this might be a common experience and writers of course write about what they know, some writers do and so on. And, and you could go through it, I, I won't go through it Showing, showing the parallels or the, or the echoes, because that's really not my point. But, but my point was, I, I'll make one more, one more parallel and then, and then stop on that. When, when, when Hayden stops on, what did I know of love's austere and lonely offices? Well, this being a Sunday and the best shoes and all of that, I don't think it's unreasonable to think of the offices to hear in the back of one's mind, religious offices. And um, it seems to me that that's part of what, what George is doing. Whether this is just two American writers with experiences of their fathers or not really doesn't matter to me, but, but it did make clear to me George's voice. Um, thank you, Marsha. I just wanted to say just very quickly, thank I appreciate that so much, just that I revered and still do the the Hayden poem 
and it was certainly in, you know, in my ear. Um, uh, you know, I, to use another Christopher Rick's phrase, you know, a flat fidelity to fact. You know, I tried to stay close to the fact of what my father did, while keeping in the back of my mind that Hayden's father was a laborer too, so he would have worked on Saturday. And here he was working again on Sunday, doing something on Sunday. So there was that parallel. And just one other thing about the word and what Marsha did um, so beautifully with that, those syllables in Lolita, I had a, you know, there was a little bit of a conundrum when I got to the word Vasiliko in the Greek. And someone said to me, well, you know, we don't really know how to, how to pronounce that. Why don't you just write it in transliteration? But I couldn't because, you know, that's, has to be my father's voice coming up from Hades, and it has to be in the Greek. So I took a risk there, but I, you know, I, um, I was sure people could look it up on Google. <laughs> None of that. The Greek really looks like the English. It looks close enough. It's close <laughs> enough, right? There's so many wonderful things here, and this is something that David Ferry does. Um, he will reuse words. He's not of the school. Oh my God, you can't use the same word. So where is it with the bead? Oh, here we go. By morning, uh, no, that's part of a sentence. I'll just start with the, with, the, with the phrase within the sentence. Drawing a bead. Now to draw a bead means to aim. And of course, George later, two lines later is gonna aim for us with the word focus, but that's what drawing a bead is. It's when you aim, drawing a bead on the dilating bead, of course your eyes dilating, right? That brightened the bureau's brass handle and kept you focused on the here and now. But, but, but I think that uh, David has given a lot of us courage um, to, to, to throw away this idea that words, words you know, lose something if they're repeated. And also, I, I love through a glass so clearly, because of course that has to echo to, through a glass darkly, which I know first from the Bergman movie, not from the Bible, but. <laughs> Why don't you go ahead, Marcia, and read yours? Oh, I haven't done that yet, okay. Catastrophe. Here I have been out Penelope, Penelope, though not a husband, yet a brother, and I've 35 years to her 20, no suitors, and about my life the loose ends fray. On the weekend, the last of us, me, was reading in the sunshine from his schoolboy copy as Odysseus makes himself known bit by bit from the right, not an eagle from Zeus, but a ladybug traveling bug far from her home, rifles the pages ahead, flies from me taking the shape of the wind. Penelope questions the stranger. He is tricked into the tail of the bedpost. She knows him, hurrah, and then grief. And I quote, Penelope thinks, Penelope speaks, think what difficulty the gods gave. They denied us life together in our prime and flowering years, kept us from crossing into age together. In his schoolboy book, he'd marked just the sixth mark in the book, these lines. He'd bracketed the four together, as well as the inside two, those twice. I had to turn my face from Ithaca and marvel at this, a sign, the first through all these years that he'd know of our cowls of sorrow and knowing would not have bid us wear them. And so he is dead, dead decades ago, could not have let us suffer. Had the gods not been rinsed from our world long ago, it might have been Wayfinder, Hermes, and Ladybug sandals marking that passage while feasts turned to massacre under my eyes. But the boy marked the passage 
and he is dead now, I know. Son of once adamant mother, self-abjected father. They never bewailed at his bier, nor I. Or you, oh my brother, made hidden farewell on the margins of our fortune, content your passage craftily marked our lives clanging upon us. Thank you, Marcia, for this great poem. Um, I love the fact that Marcia used the Greek word for catastrophe, catastrophe. Um, one of the things I want to point out is that, uh, you know, you might have heard in all through Marcia's poems that there's this, um, this, her seriousness can also be expressed through her wit. And her wit is a deepening of the seriousness. Her wit is a part of the honesty of the poem. Um, there's a wit in the first line of this. I have been out Penelope, Penelope and, and, and certainly we think of Shakespeare. And there's a, you know, there's, a, there's a playfulness there. There's a playfulness in the ladybug. And that, that is as serious as the, the, the elevated lines about the missing brother I don't know a poem, another poem like this, where um, life and literature so perfectly um, intertwined, and I'm using the word intertwined because Marsha weaves this all together like Penelope, uh, but it is a masterful um, weaving together of a text and a life. Uh, the, the lines, the, the, as Odysseus, the, the way that the Odysseus story um, becomes particular to the story of Marcia's brother, um, and that's done without any raising of the register. That's done with talking about the text, talking about the family, all at the same level register, and yet what power. Um, as Odysseus makes himself known bit by bit, as the missing brother returns through the passage, that marked passage, and I want to read it again, the, the passage that the brother marked, and it's the passage where Odysseus finally returns, and um, I'm sure many of you know it, but maybe there are some who don't, but uh, Penelope, in order to be sure that it's Odysseus and that she's not being tricked by the gods, um, tells him uh, that the bed was moved. And he becomes furious because he knows that one of the, he built the bed and one of the um, legs of the bed was the root of an olive tree. And, uh, and that, that, um, uh, that hurrah, you know, which is both witty and deadpan, devastatingly um, grief-stricken. And, and, he, and he's been gone for 10 years. He's been gone for 10, and you're, you're waiting 35 years. Right, right. You right know, been... uh, but here's the lines that, that Penelope speaks, and which are spoken as if, marked off as if spoken directly to the sister by the brother. Think what difficulty the gods gave. They denied us life together in our prime and flowering years, kept us from crossing into age together. And I think maybe that's, you know, some, that kind of proleptic grief when it rings through a poem that, that um, one almost senses that the Marsha, the child, um, in some ways anticipated, was ready for this, anticipated it and was ready for it with her language. Um, I, I just wanted to say a few more things about it. Um, uh, uh, the sign, the first through all these years, uh, uh, I turn my face from Ithaca, uh, which is, is, is very, very beautiful. And, and it's, it's turning the face away from home. Um, because it's too painful to look at. Uh, and and um, 
what, one of the things that happens right after they, they return, uh, Odysseus returns, is that the all of the suitors are massacred. So you have that line, marking this passage while feast turned to massacre under my eyes. And, and the feast of the fullness of the family and the kind of massacre in the sense of um, the devastation that the loss of the, the, the boy is going to bring to the family. Um, that struck me as very, very powerful. And the great, great moment, if, you, uh, if I can read the last three lines, uh, think back now to Marcia's Catullus poem about Catullus losing his brother. And here's the last poem of Catastrophe. Or you, oh my brother, it's a qu quoting herself, quoting her own translation, quoting Catullus, quoting his loss. And Catullus's brother died in the Troad where, where Iliad was. And you, or you, oh my brother, made hidden farewell on the margins of our fortune, content, your passage craftily marked, our lives clanging upon us. Uh, and that content, one for a second stops for a minute, is that content or content? Um, and that, that content containing the content of the grief um, preserved by the poem. But I, I think this is one of the things, if I can just go back to translation for a minute, and I want to know how we're doing for time. Uh, but the, the, the translating, I, I think one of the things that helps me as a translator, and Marsha could speak to this, is it it kind of um, it allows you to, you know, to to widen, to, to sort of play the keyboard in a larger way. But I, I think most importantly, it brings you into contact with poets who, even though they're much greater than you, there's something, there's some sort of tonality that you know you can get into your own work. And, and they, um, are extremely instructive of this. I, you know, I've always thought about speaking of David Ferry that how how all of his Roman translations are beautiful, but especially Virgil's tenderness and Virgil's delicacy and Virgil's power are, are part of David's voice. So I don't I don't want to know how much I don't want to go too far. I was going to just hop in and say we have about ten more minutes, and so um, I I don't know if you have you read. Have you like, are you ready for questions? Sure, or? yeah, why don't we do that? Let me, let me just say say one thing quickly in answer to George asked me if I, I, I think that in a very mundane to, to sort of, you, you've been so um, unmundane, but in a very mundane way, translation allows you not to have to have the thoughts. Someone else already had the hard thoughts and made all the hard connections. And it's really the one thing that painters learning to paint, like the painter behind me who learned to paint, um, they can go to an art gallery and they actually have to paint when they copy something. For us to copy, it's just handwriting, except it seems to me translation is that place where, where we can, as you say, try things and... Yeah, I was, um, this has been so, so, amazing and fascinating and i think as eileen said in the comments i could listen to this conversation for the rest of my life um <laughs> i didn't really have a question about translation only that i was wondering if because george you said you you wrote you know with rhythm and the 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 beats in your lines and i'm wondering if that is part of your work because of all the oral poems you've read from, you know, the ancient Greek and translation and things like that, if that's kind of helped the musicality. I think that's a great question. And certainly Marsha's poems are, are, are filled yeah. with complicated and beautiful meters. But I, I think it's it's, you know, part of it is is um I think part of it is temperament too. You know what? How much? You know how how much you want the line to frame something, and how important it is to you to if it moves down the page. You know these are kind of sort of temperamental things, but certainly 
translation helped me, you know, the, the poets that I most admired in translation were formalists. Mm -hmm. and, and I was trying to learn something, you know, beginning with Homer, um, who, you know, metrically and formally is doing something different every line. But I, I think it, uh, it did um, over time um, help, help, help me to have a sort of um, a more natural sense of mm -hmm. how to, to get that music across. It seems like a, a way to embody the, you've embodied it, right? And then in the translation, it's it's taking on a new life, but it still brings with it a lot of the um, original form and, and music. I, I don't know. Maybe I'm just like. Yeah, I, I think I just I just say one last thing about that. I mean, it, but it, it's it also gives you these opportunities. These the, it challenges you. Mm -hmm. uh, it challenged me to come up with that line. Now he was nothing, nothing now and nowhere. Mm -hmm. And I had to get something into that line because of the, you know, the enormity of of what Homer was saying. But to try to do it in my own voice and to find it, it, it made me be more inventive. I mean, I think sometimes. People think of translation as, oh, you have the grid, and it's true that the grid helps, but you know, it 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 requires, I think, as much poetry out of you as uh, it should as writing a poem. Marsha could speak to this. What's the grid? I'm sorry. The, the meter. Oh, okay. Okay. Right. Okay. Can I just, if if people wanted to turn on the cameras, it would be really nice to see everyone's face for a minute or two. Um, you know, George ha George has a translation. And you remind me which one it is, where his aunts, his aunts, those kind of aunts, his aunts um, aluminum foil tray. Is that what it is, George? It's so wonderful in that moment because we know it's not from the original, but 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 there's something, it's almost like when Auden and um and Love Like Law, when he says something like, if you, my dear, and you almost jump out of your chair. And, and it's the same thing. What, 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 hi, Mary, hi, Eileen. What, what poem is that, George? Well, that, that was a poem by Pessoa, uh, the great Portuguese, uh, Portuguese poet. And I had a friend, a, a, a dear friend who, who was, 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 you know, a linguist and fluent in, in the Portuguese and went through it with her. And it was a poem about Pessoa recalling his childhood and, and the sort of right. family <laughs> rituals. And it was a birthday poem. And uh, uh, I put into the poem, my aunts, you know, his, I had it as his aunts carrying these tinfoil covered trays. Probably tinfoil wasn't invented. It was at the beginning of the 20th century. And I remember my friend Glossia saying, you know, it, it's, it's not in the poem, but it is. <laughs> and and um, I- It was a up so of all people, you have this freedom because he wore all these masks. And <laughs> but I read the poem at BU in the translation seminar, and I thought one of the students was going to take me to the police. Uh, you know, she was so upset that I put something in. But that <laughs> happens with translation. Uh, right. David Ferry um, has a very beautiful Montale translation about little children playing, dancing naked. And there's railroad tracks. And I said to David, um, there's no railroad tracks in the Italian. He said, I know, um, when I got married, we were going down a railroad and I saw these kids playing. It was just like Montale's poem. Mm -hmm. And it works so beautifully within the poem. And I'm not saying you do that all the time, but that's once, that happened once for me and maybe once or twice for David and Marsha too. That's so fascinating. Yeah. I was just also gonna laugh because I um, went to BU myself a long time ago and uh, studied with Christopher Ricks just a little bit, but enough that it's like nice to hear, hear his name again. Good, and I wanted to say something about Roseanne. I wanted to mention sort of my, my teachers and say something about each. And I didn't really say much about Rosanna, but, but, I, but I think what I, in some way it's harder for me to say what I learned from her because so much of it was her manner. I also would wait in the hallway up in the sixth floor where, where her office was for hours because there'd be people in front. And then you'd walk in there and she didn't know why you came and maybe I didn't know why I came. 
but we'd sit there and we'd look at poems, either mine, or somebody else's. And she, it was just, there's just such a gracefulness, a graciousness um, mm -hmm. that isn't separate from her poem. Yeah, I just wanted to add to that. Um, what happened to me with, at BU it's, it was long after Rosanna was gone and she, it, she had a translation seminar where world-class translators would come from Europe and come from all over. And, and, and she was just masterful at teaching us how to negotiate uh, very, different, very different kinds of poems in different languages and, and with great generosity and expertise and passion. Um, I can't say enough about Roseanne. I think we might have to leave it here because even though I think everybody's on board with Eileen being able to listen to the two of you for the rest of our lives, um, we try to end pretty on time so that everybody can get to the rest of their lives. So, um, well, when they come, when they when they when they tap our phones, we'll make sure they send you all copies of. There we, we go. Send. There we go. So I would love for everybody to unmute and give Marsha and George a round of applause for this evening's program, please. Yay. Thank you. It was really wonderful. Thanks so much. We really appreciate it. <laughs> so much. We were both so nervous, but it. You were great. You're both great. We've shared book links in the in the chat and Marsha's uh, social media information. We hope everybody will buy books by these poets and connect with them as you are able. Um, we'd also love if you follow us on our social media accounts and sign up for our newsletter. We promise we won't bombard your inbox, but we do send some pretty great information. I've listed those links in the chat. Thank you so much for coming to this event and we hope to see you all again really soon. Good, Good night. Thanks.